It is great to see everybody here this Lord's Day. The week goes by so fast, and that's okay with me, to come back together with you and to worship our God and to, to um, encourage one another and fellowship. It's just a wonderful uh, time of the week to be here uh, together to worship our God. It's great to see those who are with us today, everybody that's with us today, and for those who are visiting with us, you are honored guests, and we, we are so happy you're with us uh, this Lord's Day. You know, when you think about uh, a king, what, what do you think about? What do you think about uh, the attributes or what a king is to represent? What comes to mind when you think of that word king? You know, the worldly view of a king, of course we know it would be royalty, right? It would be uh, a man sitting on a throne, wearing a crown and sitting on a throne. One who has power, right? Who has, who has prestige, who has wealth, who has influence over his subjects. But a lot of kings also are uh, self-righteous. They often, they, they rule with an iron fist. They, they kind of lead like a military uh, dictator. I'm not saying every king does that, but when we look in the Bible, we see uh, most of the kings were that way. Most of the kings were not good kings, and they instilled fear in the people. And see, they had power to, to throw someone in jail or to even execute their subjects. And so we think about in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God's people were calling for a king. They wanted a handsome king, right? They wanted one who was tall and this, this good-looking king. And Israel, they got their handsome king, didn't they? They got a, a king by the name of Saul, and he was a good-looking one, and he was tall, just what they wanted. Did he end up turning out to be good for them? No, he was not. He was a bad king. In the New Testament, the Jews were looking for someone that was spectacular to come to them, to, to come and to lead them, to rule over a physical kingdom. They wanted this man of war, so to speak. That he was going to come and he was going to rescue them. He was going to be the strong man and he was going to take on the Romans and he was going to uh, take the Romans out and he was going to set them free. But God sent them a different kind of king. God has sent us a different kind of king. See, Jesus was born a king. He was born a king to testify the power from Above the power that he brought down from heaven. See, Jesus claimed that he was royalty. Pilate asked Jesus the question, So you are a king? Well, look how Jesus responded in John chapter 18 and verse 37. Jesus says, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. See, the wise men knew this, and, and they knew that uh, Jesus was born, and they knew that this baby was royalty, and we're going to be talking more about the wise men next week, but in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, it says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. You know, you think about that, when we see a movie where there's a prince or a princess involved and we see the future of a king and a queen, why is it such a big deal for the people to have that, to, to have this king and queen and to continue to have them rule over them? You think about it, why is that? Why is it they want to keep that dynasty going, especially if they have a good king? You know, they, want, they don't want to lose that. They don't want their kingdom to come to ruin. Jesus was born a king. Jesus' whole life testified of his kingship and what his kingship meant to you and I, what his kingship meant to this world. You think about that. You think about Jesus being your king. That means you and I are his subjects. How important is that to you, that you have a king like Christ? Doesn't uh, the fate of us as his people, as 
as the body of Christ, as the kingdom, as the church here on this earth? Does, uh, doesn't that rest in his hands? See, that's what the people who have a king, that they, they, when they had a, a king, that's their fate rested in the king and the queen's hands. We look at our king, our spiritual king, and our life, our souls, rest in his hands. You know, in the Old Testament, there were many horrible kings who were not men of God. See, the truth did not matter to these kings. They had no care for the truth. It was all about them. One of the kings, there's so many of them. One of the kings, Jehu, Israel's king, he murdered many in Kings chapter 10. Judah's king, Manasseh, he built all altars to foreign gods in the temple. And it says that he sacrificed his own son. I can't even fathom that. Second Kings chapter uh, 21 and verse 6. Ahab, however, did more evil than any of these kings. It doesn't have to be that you murder a bunch of people to do evil in the sight of God. We see in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 to 33, we see that he departed from God. He built a, 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 a um, altar, uh, built a temple to Baal, a, a idol. He did that at, to foreign God. And the Bible tells us when we read that, he, he continuously resisted Elijah, which of course means that he was resisting God. And he drew condemnation down from heaven, from God, because of his spiritual adultery, because of his infidelity to God. And when you think about that, you think about his sin. His sin led people away from God. The Bible tells us that he did more evil than any other king because of leading people away from the Lord. See, sin does not have to be vicious or it doesn't have to be violent uh, to be damaging, does it? It's extremely deadly when you think about an act of drawing people away from the Lord. Giving your allegiance to something that's not of God and people following you in that. That's a terrible thing because it's not only your soul that's in jeopardy. It's the people that you lead away from the Lord that their soul is in jeopardy. Jesus is the greatest of all the kings. So for the next few minutes, I would say the next 15 minutes or so, let's just look at some spiritual or some godly, uh, the godly view, uh, the principles of our king, these qualities that, that Jesus held. There's so many more. We only have time for these this morning. Being born of a king, Jesus was a man of peace. Those who truly follow Christ are going to be people who walk, who live their lives in peace. Romans chapter 12 and verse 14 through 18. Caesar Augustus was considered Rome's greatest emperor. And because of the uh, census that he ordered in uh, Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10, Jason talked a little bit about that in class today. Joseph and Mary, they left Nazareth and they took baby uh, Jesus to Bethlehem. This was the birthplace also of David. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and also in chapter 17 tells about that story how Samuel traveled to Bethlehem to anoint David. Not too far from here, Mary gave birth to the greatest king that were ever lived, our king Jesus. Now we already went over this last couple, couple weeks and we think about the authenticity of Jesus being the king, there's two things that needed to take place. And we, we looked at this. We looked at how first he needed to come from the royal lineage of David. And he sure did, because we read in Matthew chapter 1 and also in Luke chapter 3, gives us that lineage of this Jesus, of our Jesus. He came through David. So we know that he fulfilled that. He was the Messiah like Matthew 1 tells us about. The Messiah is the anointed one, the anointed king. Second, his birth was to be the most unique, and we know that it was because he was born 
of a virgin that we looked at last week. His birth was miraculous, born of a virgin. Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 9 and 6 states, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Now, Augustus then laid a foundation of peace. It was called the Pax Romana. It was the Roman peace and the tranquility throughout the land. It went into North Africa, and then also it went into Persia. It was called the Golden Age of Peace. But when you think about that, when man does that, that only lasts so long. That peace didn't last forever. That peace came to an end. And that peace only went so far. When we look at our king, we look at the almighty God, Jesus as our king. We know that Jesus made peace available to everyone to the ends of the world. Now, of course, this world has been very, uh, hasn't been a real peaceful place. But Jesus is there offering peace to you and I. We can go to him. We have peace when we live in Christ. He was born a king, but he was called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9 and the second part of verse 6. Look what Paul wrote to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. He wrote, and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth are things in heaven. Jesus' peace is far greater than any emperor. It's far greater than any king could ever give to the world. Because when we think about it, most kings are not kings who are peaceful. Most kings are about going out and conquering what they could conquer. But that's not our king, is it? That's not Christ. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 38, a whole crowd of disciples said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Yes, our King Jesus was a man of peace. He brings a peaceful way to our lives if we allow it to. If we bring that word of God into our hearts and we take it in and we believe it, we will live peaceful lives. We won't act like the world acts. We won't be about revenge. We won't be about that. When someone's mean to us, we're not going to be mean back to them. We're going to try to be kind and live peaceful lives as Christians to show Christ in our lives. Second, born a king, Jesus was a man of principle. See, Jesus' number one prior, his priority was all about pleasing his heavenly Father. That should be our Number one priority is pleasing our Father, living with His Son, walking in the steps of Jesus. That should be ours too. Think about that. Think about when Jesus was 12 years old. Mary and Joseph were wondering where He was at in Luke chapter 2, that He went missing and they're searching all over for this young boy. And they found Him in the temple. And He was in the temple and He was teaching the, the Jewish leaders there and He's teaching the, the rabbis there. This 12 year old and they were astonished at his teaching because we know his teaching came down from heaven above that powerful truth and he astonished them and look what he wrote in uh, said in Luke chapter 2 verse 49 and he said to them why is it that you were looking for me did you not know that I had to be in my father's house your version may see I'm about my father's business right Jesus, our, our godly king. Our godly king was a rabbi like no other. And he wasn't just a rabbi. He wasn't just a great teacher. He was a teacher of God. He was a God teacher. He went about teaching the business of God, what came down from heaven. That's what our king is about. The earthly kings are usually about their own agenda, about their own business. Their business is not about God's business, it's about power 
and a bunch of other things that aren't of God, not our King. Jesus was all about God, and Jesus was a selfless King. About His Father's power. It took first priority. What was that first priority? What was He teaching there? When we know that Jesus was sent here, He was sent here to bring salvation down from heaven. It was all about seeking and saving those people who were lost in sin. And that's what He was doing when He came down here to teach. Salvation, yes, has been brought down. That was the most important thing to Jesus. But pleasing His heavenly Father took great sacrifice, didn't it? And when you think about that, you think about a, a word, humility. See, humility played a key word in Jesus being able to go about teaching about the kingdom of God, teaching about what we need to do in order to have our sins taken away, being forgiven of our sins, and being having to be disciples of His. Jesus was a humble king. He was a humble king. See, we see this first in, in his humble birth. He was born in a condition of poverty. His parents could only give a, a poor offering when they went to the temple to dedicate him. And that must, have, that must have hurt. But that's all they had. If they had the best, that's what they would have offered. They were poor. He came from very humble beginnings. Let's look, let's look at just two ways real quickly in how Jesus was a humble king and how he showed his humility. First of all, he showed his humility by teaching by example. See, Jesus never taught what he was not willing to do himself. He never would, would, would say, hey, do this, and he wasn't going to submit to that, and he wasn't going to also do that. How many do that? How many managers do that? You got to think about how many kings were like that to their subjects. You know, being hypocrites to them. Jesus was no hypocrite. Jesus taught by both precept and example. We know one, we know these examples. These examples uh, we've we've gone over over and over in our lessons. First of all, when he washed his disciples' feet, when we look at John. Chapter 13, here you, you have his disciples, and they're, they're learning from their teacher. They're learning from their rabbi, their master, the, the Lord of their lives. And he gets down there, and he starts washing their feet. What was the lesson that he gave to them when he did that? I mean, Peter is thinking, you know, you're not, you can wash my feet. Like, you're the Messiah. You're the, you're the Lord. But he was teaching them service, wasn't he? He was teaching them, if I, your great teacher, if I could get down there and I could wash your feet, then that means you could do that to one another. You could serve one another. A second example would be when Jesus was baptized. I had someone ask me the other day, and they said, why was Jesus baptized? when he didn't need to have remission of sin? It's a great question, isn't it? And we won't get into that today. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. See, all men of Judea were to go to John the Baptist and be baptized of him. It tells us that in, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 5, and also in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 5. And Jesus set that example. See, he was 100% man too, wasn't he? So Jesus went down and he got baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If the Lord could do that, if your great teacher, if your master could do that, then he says you are to do that. An example. We have to remember that that, that our teaching will, will have no bearing on others. It will have no power of influence over others unless our teaching comes by 
example. It has to be done by example or it won't do anything. The Word of God is powerful. The Gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. But all it is is words if we don't believe it and we do not show it. Second, Jesus' way of showing humility. He left His Father's side there in heaven. On the right hand of God, on the throne of God. Think about that. He left His heavenly home and came to be the suffering servant. Came to this wretched world to serve and to suffer. We know that nobody has suffered like Jesus did. See, Jesus lowered Himself by taking all the limitations of humanity. And the Bible tells us that He took the form of a doulos. He took a form of a bond slave. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 through 8. And He lowered Himself. And He became obedient to death. Yeah, even death of the cross, like it tells us in that passage. The greatest of all kings gave up his heavenly royal home, all those heavenly luxuries that he had, and he came here to suffer. Let me ask you, what earthly king would do that? Can you think of one? You may say, well, David. But even David did God wrong. Jesus never did the Father wrong. He's a perfect king. See, when we think about Jesus and we think about this and his, his humility and his, his suffering, being a suffering servant and, and, and even to death, you know, God doesn't expect you and I to do that, to die. So this really, the application here really applies to us in just a different way. See, we must be willing to sacrifice, though, for God's sake. I mean, think about this. Would you be willing to give up everything you have to follow God? I was having a conversation with Tommy the other day, and, and he mentioned his guns. And then when he said his guns, I mentioned my fishing poles, my fishing tackle. And you think about it. Am I willing to give that up? And some of the things, who cares about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's just material things. We're not going to bring those things with us. But when they're important to us here, and you say, give it up. God's not saying to go sell your house or your car or all your things to follow Him. If those are getting in the way, then cut those out of your life because you're not bringing them with you when you die. They, they won't matter anymore. Are you willing to give it all up for Jesus because He gave it all up for you and I? Yes, Jesus was a man of peace and He was a man of priority. What a king. And also, Jesus was born a king to leave us a precious legacy. You know, when a parent, our parents die, when that last parent dies, they, they leave a legacy for their children. A legacy is defined as a birthright or traditions that they may leave, a, a heirloom, something that the family name may represent, something maybe of great wealth, maybe a family business that they leave for them. Maybe a house or houses, property, well-respected name. But we think about that, we think of an inheritance, don't we? An estate, our, our, our great wealth, our, or just wealth in general. Children are entrusted with their ownership to what belongs to their parents. You know, I want to leave my family with the legacy that I followed Christ all of my days. That they could say, yeah. He made his mistakes, yeah, we do. But I know that he was about God. He followed God. He left that example for us to follow. That's what I want to leave my girls. I'm not going to leave them a state. I'm not going to leave them money. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll do my best. But what, what is that? Money money's nothing. The house whoever it may be, is nothing. But God, the King, when He's given us, that's everything. That is everything. Let us never forget what we have. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, 
to then have children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now we are God's children. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. See, we share in the sufferings with Christ right now, but we also have looked forward to the glory with our co-heir Christ later on. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Of that inheritance. See, the term, the term heirs of God emphasizes our relationship to God, the Father. And his children, we, we, as his children, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 states, we have an inheritance that can never perish, can never spoil, it can never fade away, and it's kept in heaven. Yeah, a lot of people who get large inheritances from the death of their parents on this earth, it doesn't take long before it's gone. Spent. Wasted. You don't have to worry about that with God's inheritance, with our inheritance that we get from heaven above. The Greek term translated heirs in Romans 8, 17, refers to those who receive their allotted possession by right of sonship. In other words, because God has made us children, like it says in John chapter 1 and verse 12, we have given, have been given by God. See, we can't say it's just our right. We have been given it by God by being His children, by being His obedient, faithful body, kingdom of Christ. We have give, been given that by God. Those full rights to receive his inheritance. That's such a beautiful thing. The Bible tells us that we are his beneficiaries in Matthew 25 and verse 34, and also in Galatians 3, verse 29, Colossians 1, 12 and 3, 24. Ephesians 1, 5 says, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave to the devil in sin, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5 through 7. See, God has left us everything. because of what he did for us on the cross. Because he went to the cross, and because he died on the cross, and because he was buried in the grave, and because he rose the third day. He shed that precious blood for us. We have an inheritance that will never be taken away, an eternal inheritance waiting for us because we have been adopted as his children. Isn't that beautiful? When we compare an earthly king to our King Christ. There is no comparison, is there? Why give our allegiance to any ruler, any king, any president who does not love us, who does not have our best interest at heart, one who, will, who may rule over us with an iron fist, who may control us? Why give our allegiance to one who will not leave us in good shape, who will not leave us an inheritance? Do you want to be subject to such a king or such a ruler or president? I do not. Looking at Jesus, there is no greater king. Doesn't even come close, does it? Because we have a king who testifies of the power that has come down from heaven, who testifies of the truth, and only the truth will set you free, John chapter 8 and verse 12. We have a king who is of peace. A king whose priority is to please God. A king who loves us and who has saved us, who has laid down his life for us, that we may live forever. We have a king who has taken care of us. He takes care of his children. We have a king who has left us what no man could ever leave us. And that's an eternal inheritance. Hold on to that. Hold that close to your heart because you have everything in Jesus. 
and your King. The lesson is yours this morning. Is Jesus your King? Have you been living your life subject to your King? The whole world is subject to Jesus, but not the whole world that we know, not even close, are following Him that way. If we're not careful, the world could pull us away from our King. If, that's, if, he's, if that has happened to you, if that's happened to you right now, right now you could come back to your King. You could come back, and He will open, open His arms and bring you in as one of His children. He doesn't look at you as a subject. He looks at you as his faithful children. Even if you fall away and you come back, he loves you like he always has loved you. You need prayer. You need to be baptized into Christ this morning, have remission of sins, and be part of his kingdom. Don't wait. Come as we stand and we sing the invitation song.